My name is John Stewart. I'm the executive director of the Miami Beach Urban Studios, which on normal circumstances are located at uh, on Lincoln Road in Miami Beach. And on these circumstances, we are in um, going virtual and uh, hosting events, in this case with, um, with the Betsy Hotel, a, a very close neighbor to ours, both physically and, and obviously kind of emotionally and spiritually. And we came up with a, with a project uh, called Zen and the Art of, and we've been looking at poetry, we've been looking at music and at, at architecture, we'll be looking at photography, and tonight we'll be looking at Zen and the Art of, photo of, of Poetry with Campbell McGrath. And I'm, I'm here with Deborah Briggs, who is co-hosting this with me, and I'm gonna let Deborah take over from here, but I hope you have a good time. You're, um, you'll be on mute, and you can send me questions uh, during, the, during the presentation or this time that we have together with Campbell in his lovely living room uh, with some of his artworks above him. And um, then uh, just send them to me, the host, and, uh, and I will try to pass them along as best I can. So with that, I'm passing this over to Deborah, And I'm unmuting you, Deborah. there you go. Hello, everyone, good evening. I'm Deborah Briggs and I'm Vice President for uh, Arts and Community at the Betsy Hotel on Ocean Drive. And uh, with my brother, um, I founded the Betsy Writers Room. And the reason I tell you that is uh, my, our friendship and partnership with Campbell goes all the way back to the, the opening of the Writers Room. Um, and uh, he's been a tremendous partner of, of the Betsy's. Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about Campbell tonight before he reads, just so you'll get a sense for um, his tremendous career. Campbell McGrath is a poet whose work is characterized by lyrical skill, intellectual breadth, and humor. His, uh, one of his recent works, Spring Comes to Chicago, is noted for its reflective intelligence and comic ebullience. In it, as in his other work, he combines both a personal and acute historical consciousness as he maps the social, cultural, and natural landscapes of America. He has a grand vision, raw energy, and keen ear for the subtleties of the modern condition. And that has led critics to compare him to Allen Ginsberg and William Carlos Williams, to other great poets. Though his work is a reflection of our age and society, McGrath has its own unique voice. It's an expansive prose poetry that accumulates images and metaphors through the use of symbols and tangible everyday details. And uh, this, uh, most of us who know Campbell as a friend know that he is a genius, but uh, <laughs> the MacArthur Foundation called him one uh, actually many years ago now, and that little excerpt I read you was from their website. Now just a little bit more, you know, he is a, um, he's the Philip and Patricia Frost Professor of Creative Writing and a professor of English at Florida International University, and the author of many, many books. He's a Guggenheim Fellowship winner, he's won the Kingsley Tuff Prize, and his poetry has appeared in the New Yorker, Harper's, The Atlantic, and on the op-ed page of the New York Times, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we're really proud of Campbell, and we're proud that his poetry is included on the Betsy Poetry Rail. That's a rail my family created of uh, 12 writers who shaped Miami culture. Campbell's poem, Hemingway Dines on Boiled Shrimp and Beer, appears on the Betsy Poetry Rail, and I urge you to go see it. It's a lot of fun. Thank you so much for sharing your talents with us tonight, Campbell, on celebrating National Poetry Month with us. So we're celebrating National Poetry Month and celebrating great poetry, something the world needs now more than ever, as we all know. Thanks, Campbell. I pass it to you. Thank you, Deborah especially since I see that you are phoning in from the International Space Station, and that must be a very uh, trying circumstance for you. And uh, thank you, John and MBUS, for uh, continuing to put culture and life out there in these complicated times. I'm, I, I've learned that I'm much more comfortable in the real three-dimensional world than I am in this virtual landscape. Um, Totally. So, I totally uh, am with you on that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 it's interesting. I mean, it should be easier. Yeah. Theoretically, I find it harder, you know, strangely. So, yeah. um, so this is my first online reading, um, but I think we're going to enjoy it. Also, I hope everybody has a glass of <laughs> extra large glass of rosé. Okay. Or, or some other. Cheers. <laughs> another happy hour beverage. This is Zen and the Art of Poetry. We are supposed to be enjoying the uh, spiritual and material peace and comfort of art in these trying times. So 
uh, give this event is is Miami Beach centric, sponsored by two you know of Miami Beach's uh, essential cultural organizations. I'm gonna read poems about Miami Beach, of all crazy things, which has been my home for 27 some years now. I see lots of friends and family uh, out there, which is fun. Um, you know, your pictures are leaping in front of my eyes. <laughs> Slightly distracted, but let's not worry about that. So I'm going to read basically three little groups of three poems each. So I'm going to start with three old poems about Miami Beach. These are from my book, Florida Poems. This one's called The Orange. Gone to swim after walking the boys to school. Both of the boys are online right now. I'm looking at their faces too. No <laughs> longer walking them to school, sadly. Gone to swim after walking the boys to school. Overcast morning, midweek, off season. Few souls to brave the warm storm-tossed waves. Not wild, but rough for this tranquil coast. Swimming now, in rhythm, arm over arm. Let the ocean buoy the body and the legs work little. Wave overhead, crash and roll with it. Breathe, stretch and build, windmill, climb the foam. Breathe, breathe. Traveling downwind, I make good time and spot the marker by which I know to halt and forge my way ashore. Who am I to question the current? Surely this peace abiding. Walking back along the beach, I mark the signs of erosion. Bide the usual flotsam of seagrass and fan coral, afloat from somebody's fish crusted with sponge and barnacles, and then I find the orange. Single irradiant sphere on the sand, tide washed, glistening as if newborn, thin orb, miraculous ur fruit in all that sweep of horizon, the only point of color. Cross-legged on my towel, I let the juice course and mingle with the film of salt on my lips and the sand in my beard as I steadily peel and eat it. Considering the ancient lineage of this fruit, the long history of its dispersal around the globe on currents of animal and human migration, and in light of the important citrus industry to the state of Florida, I will not claim it was the best and sweetest orange in the world, though it was. Oh, great salt water of eternity. Oh, strange and bountiful orchard. Home entirely describes my sense of arrival in Miami Beach 27 years ago, like as if one had washed ashore on Martian or other landscape of such, such vast what one was used to. Uh, here's it's uh, a kindred poem, I'm another citrus-based Florida poem, a very, very short poem. The key line. Curiously yellow hand grenade of flavor, Molotov cocktail for a revolution against the bland. That's, that's it. That's a, uh, a poem. It turns out to be a little bit of an Ars Poetica in it. Poetry similarly comes in a small pack. It packs an outsized uh, revolutionary punch, cultural punch. So Campbell, let me just, one more. Read, you're reading one more and then we'll do some questions. I have some questions already from our audience are there. Read one more uh, kind of yeah. older, kind of arriving, my arrival in Miami Beach years ago. I, I had arrived in a, in a foreign land, but again, it seems that way. This is at the Royal Palm Barber Shop. Uh, we live on, on uh, Royal Palm Avenue, and the Royal Palm Barbershop was for years and years located just down in the corner. It's changed hands finally. But I do mention, I don't know if Eddie's watching tonight, Eddie Pereira, my, my, who cut my hair for about 25 years, retired and moved to the west coast of Florida with his daughter. But I, he's, a, he's a Facebook friend of mine, so I know he, he, he and his wife had, I think, their 60th anniversary recently. Wow. At the Royal Palm Barbershop. At the Royal Palm Barbershop, I am hailed by bells. I am called Young Fellow. I reside within the Nautilus chambers of memory. At the Royal Palm Barbershop, we peruse the local papers and rattan chairs, chew upon unlit El Productos, jig the Palomino tassels of ours while we wait. 
the heavy pedestal, ball glass, ashtrays, carol the tunes of yesteryear, anachronistic as barroom cuspidors, as the blue dissidal vials of aqua velva encrypted in lost codes of tonic and dust. The do's and don'ts of handsome hair adorn the paneled walls, travel posters bespeaking identity, Jerusalem and Havana, Miami Beach, three flags for Cuba, Israel, and the U.S. of A. At the Royal Palm Barbershop, there was no extra charge for waffler styling. At the Royal Palm Barbershop, I surrender to the ritual ministrations of compassion, lave and salve, adoration of the straight razor, the laying on of hands. The scissor clip behind an ear keys the echolocation of bats, nosings of a mole, the fruit rat upon his twilight vigil. At the Royal Palm Barbershop, Kenny displays his diploma from the College of Coiffure, his specialty, the sculpture cut, a practice he works on the weak-willed or unwary. The man on the next chair appears to have drowned within a turban of hot towels and lather, toes unholy as bloated otters in tiny buckets of oiled water. Whoops, you've just kind of... Agents of this world, I plight my truth. You've frozen there for a now. moment. My yeah, internet connection is unstable. I really hate that. I don't know why that's happening all of a sudden here. Um, toes boiled. Toes were boiled. They were they were toes unholy as bloated otters in tiny buckets of boiled water. It's a very musical line. I'm going to point that out to you. Uh, <laughs> uh, at the Royal Palm Barbershop, I am whisked and talked. I pledge again my allegiance to this world. I plight my truth to the fateful arms of the light, shorn of the weight of the present unburdened of past, little changed and yet renewed. At the Royal Palm Barber Shop, you can crunch gumballs on your way out the door, click the tutti-frutti castanets of chiclets for a nickel, crack your enamel on a Jewish fund jawbreaker, or toss a bill for hermanos al rescate as you wave so long to Joseph, Eddie, Alex, Ken. At the Royal Palm Barber Shop, we are all brothers and saved. Well, I didn't see any more rebuffering there, so hopefully we made it through. <laughs> very, um, very nice. Very, very good. Um, uh, yeah, we I, I, yeah, we had a question about um, how the, because you mentioned the, how long you've been here uh, in Miami Beach, and you're really focused on Miami Beach, and the question was how the literary community has changed, like what you found when you arrived, I mean, and how it's changed over the last 30 years. You've obviously had a, a big part in, played a big part in, in that change. So is there well, anything you can talk about? Yeah, indeed. I mean, Miami has had a fantastic, you know, 10, 15 years culture-wise. I mean, I, I've been here, I'm not, it seems to me that not that much changed in my first decade here, or there was a slow change. Change. That, that's Whoops, we're, we're part of Miami, and it's just continued. We're buffering again. Yeah, yeah, you buffered. You, you, you started to talk about change, and then uh, that kind of cut out a little bit. But the book fair, the book fair started. Oh, right. Big literary kind of energy that Miami has sustained, and then it's really flourished in the last 10, 15 years, in particular. Oh, Miami is a great. It's the best poetry festival in the country, in my mind. Most exciting and diverse. Uh, the universities, FIU, we've yeah. been teaching great students for all these years. They've gone out into the community. All of Miami's kind of literary institutions at this point are kind of directed by alums of our FIU writers program. So we've had a great uh, flourishing of all the arts in Miami, visual arts, literary arts, performing arts. And I had, an, I had another question from a, a listener or a listener or a, a, somebody in our gathering with us um, that asked what poetic line comes to mind that summarizes maybe the time we're living in? What poetic, what was the poetic, what poetic line comes to mind? Summarizes the time we're living in? Yeah. The, uh, <laughs> uh, no pressure. <laughs> If it comes to you, you can think about it. Uh, to, I was thinking about those tiny uh, toes, like 
loaded otters in boiled water, but I don't think that's going to be. A, I'm going to read I, I, poems is very much out of the times we're in. Um, okay. you know, I, I was reading kind of throwback poems. I'm going to get more. I mean, I think, you know, the, the immediate times we're in is, is a, a coronavirus moment, but, but it's funny because we were in during the uh, slowly evolving crisis of sea level rise here in Miami, which people, which now seems to people very quaint <laughs> and, uh, you know, like a bygone concern. Um, right. Unfortunately, it's, it's gonna, it's, it's still here. Yes, yes, it is. Absolutely. Well, and, and just re let me remind everybody who's gathered with us, please just, there's a chat. Um, the chat is located down next to where it says share screen. There may be a share screen button at the bottom of your screen and you can uh, send a message to me, uh, John Stewart, and I will try my best to relay the uh, question um, to our exalted poet if I'm able. Um, so. Should we go back to poetry, John? Yes. Yes. Let's do it. Okay, I'm going to read three new uh, poems, new in the sense that they're not in any book. Uh, the book I'm working on is a book about sea level rise in one sense. It's really about the Atlantic Ocean in a much broader sense in terms of heritage, immigration, connectivity, and our lives here in Miami being so immediately uh, impacted by sea level rise and kind of that future tense. So this one's called On the Three Forms of Water. Since I learned about sea level rise, I've been binge watching the Atlantic Ocean, but nothing ever really happens. It goes up, it goes down. Sometimes high tide floods a section of the city, which is nice for the street sweepers and canoeists. I'm so used to thinking about myself that it's hard to understand the sea. What use is singularity in imagining that seamless quicksilver commonwealth? The ocean is liquid like the mind. Elastic tides of consciousness flowing and probing, interrogating whatever seeks to contain it. Ice is like the body, scarred and fractured, ordained to crack, diminish, melt away. And the third form, fog on a window, ghostly mist, the clouds which adorn the sky in celestial vestments we glimpse as gaudy rags at sunset, what could it be but the soul? We are liquid and we are solid, oceanic matter cloaked in the garment of being. As for the ocean, she is coming to collect us and gather us back into herself as when, long ago, your mother picked you up early from the nurse's office at school and gave you a kiss and put you to bed where you slept without a care in the world. I hope my mother is on this conference. I see my brother, but I don't see my mom, but I think she's here somewhere. Um, here's another one. This poem is so new that it doesn't even really have a title. Uh, it has a couple titles. I think it's going to end up being a piece of a longer poem. It's a little bit of a elegy for the for Miami Beach, uh, and it's definitely dedicated to all of my uh, long-term Miami Beach friends, many of whom I also see out there. Oh, there's my mom. I hope she heard that last moment. Um, this is uh, this is about kind of the, the the spirit of our lives here in Miami Beach over these last almost thirty years. Looking back. The surprise, it's not its disappearance, but it's ever having been. The unlikely dredging up from salt muck and blade sharp undergrowth of something with a passing resemblance to land, however tenuous, however permeable. The pinioning of mangrove sandbars into skinny islands elaborated over decades with golf courses and finger canals and a bonanza of palm-encircled trophy homes, a great dream born of the ocean and to its briny bosom returned. Such shall be the judgment of the disinterested future tut-tutting our folly, which indeed it was, laughable, foolhardy, a contract with the devil and the mortgage broker, but who could say no to this deal? A lesser paradise it may be, but there are weeks when the ocean here takes your breath away. No hots, no colds, 
only the ambient warmth of wind and tide harmoniously synced to the body's inner weather. There is that moment on the still warm sand, just gathered darkness, cruise ships blazing against the shadow milk of the horizon, clouds at sunset like soft-skinned jewels. It's time to go home. Friends are recorking the wine, folding up beach chairs. But how can you leave when the lights of the millionaire's condos shine so invitingly, though you were not invited? And the hotel lights, and the lights of inbound airplanes, and of the stars flying outward toward the edge of an ever-expanding universe become indistinguishable? Or is it just that such distinctions are irrelevant? We've lived in Miami Beach nearly 30 years now, in a house which carries our family history etched into its beams and door frames, a house which sits, if the deed is to be trusted, 5.5 feet above sea level. Not bad for these parts, of course, to last. Sea level rise, climate change, global warming. It's a problem that needs a catchier nickname. The laziest of natural disasters. All the urgency of volcanoes, tsunamis, earthquakes, replaced by dull implacability. Nautilism so much as a dispossession, a set of assets. We don't even need to get our shoes wet. Campbell, I Holmes. don't know if you can hear me. To the but young, it seems an injustice. My buffering. Shoes wet was the, yeah, and then you buffered. What do you heard was a seizure of assets? Shoes wet. We don't even need to get our shoes wet. It only wants our beaches, harbors, neighbors, cities, homes. That was like the tragic payoff line. Yeah, I know, I know. I was, I was really hanging on it. I mean. Okay, what can I do? To the young, it seems an injustice perpetrated against them by thoughtless and self-indulgent boomers. To me, it's tragic, yet strangely inevitable. I'm finding it harder year by year to separate my concern for the planet from the specter of my own mortality projecting the movie of my melancholy upon the ocean's screen. Why not? We are both middle-aged, me and the Atlantic. We could be cranking ZZ Top together, eulogizing the glory days. I recall a world before Starbucks, and it remembers the breakup of Pangaea, the sundering of continents into puzzle pieces yearning for Gondwana land. Again, oh, a year, you buffered just there, uh, Gondwana land. Well, as long as we got Gondwana land in there, I'm feeling... You got Gondwana land in there. I'm so sorry for doing this to you. It's a fascinating way to... such epic <laughs> listen to, to Listen to poetry, because I kind of get into these, like into the moment, and then the technology just kind of pulls me, or cuts you off, so I'm sorry. Uh, again, we're all happier in our three-dimensional selves. Yes. Our current troubles seem no more than ebb and flow, an incremental inundation. Earth evolves, life entails loss, time reigns triumphant. Still, there are those days, the perfect gradient of sunlight, the Gulf Stream strewing its bounty along the coast, and the color of the water in that season, celadon and bottle glass and amethyst, a nameless color I will carry to the bitter end. There is that moment on the sand at twilight that has ruined me for life in any other place. In a world of tidal erasure, what claim can our localized calamities stake? Why, on a funeral train loaded with hungry polar bears, spare a second thought for this shimmering citadel, this archipelago of flowers and beautiful people at play? Who will mourn for Florida after it is gone? So that's a piece. A pa that's a panel of a of a kind of large. That's amazing. Florida. It's just <laughs> that incredible. Was main, that was the main thing I wanted to uh, make sure I, I read tonight. That's, that's a that's a world premiere. That was incredible. I mean, I I wouldn't even mind hearing it again. But um, I don't know. We're not gonna do that. I understand. 
I just said I wouldn't. I wouldn't be offended. Um, I did have a question. Are you are you in yeah, question let's, mode? Let's, let's, yes. It was really a question about your uh, daily practice as a poet and what what, what that entails. Well, um, it entails um, trying to think as many poetic thoughts as I can. It entails. Well, right now it entails trying not to go. You know kind of utterly crazy because it seems to me that the whole mode right now is time up into tiny scraps and throwing it in the air. You know, I, I mean, it's just literally, I, I don't even know how to describe what the process of what we're doing now is. It's so strange how days disappear, weeks disappear. There's no more demarcations or, or milestones. And it, and it's so odd where we are, um, which isn't unlike where poets often spend their time wandering around inside their own heads on a slightly obsessive echoing cavern. Um, so, you know, it's not absolutely unknown to me, this state that we're in now, but I, I, I do have a, you know, I get up and I try to sit at my desk a couple hours every day, but it varies. If I'm really working on something I like, like that Miami Beach poem I've been writing, I've been writing a couple of big poems I like recently, so I'm really happy to be at my desk six or seven hours just, you know, kind of going through drafts and I lose track of what's going on and, and what have you. Um, but then you finish a piece, you're not really sure what's next. You open, you know, you're looking at different poems and your mind's, you know, bouncing around. So it's that any creative process. Some days you've got the good stuff going on and you're really excited to be engaged with it. Other days you're, you're hoping, other days you stare at the same computer screen and nothing happens and you don't know why. Well, that kind of leads uh, really well into another question about um, how you write longer poems and how you kind of know when and how you get to the end. And I'm, I kind of think that also is a really interesting question in, in our kind of moment of great distraction. Um, but I, maybe you can, can reflect on that in good times and in bad. Endings, I mean, endings are the hardest part of poems. It's not... I mean, if you, if you pick up a, a book of poems or a literary magazine, almost all the poems start off well and they don't all end well. It's very closure, which is, you know, our fancy word for endings in poetry land. Closure is very tricky. Um, I mean, ideally, closure, you know, is, I don't know, there's a lot of metaphors for it. It's like the sound of a perfectly made box lid closing. It's, the, you know, it, we, we hear it in music a lot, I think. Um, not so much in Orlando, but uh, I see Orlando on the screen in front of me there. <laughs> but in, uh, in kind of classical, in Mozart, you know, you know when the end is coming and you know, you recognize themes and chords and progressions. I don't even, you know, and you know, ah, I know the end is coming. I know it's going to come now and it feels perfect. It's just made right. Um, mm -hmm. Ideally, that's what a poem finds. So a long poem is harder because you've covered all this distance and you've, you have your, it, a long poem, you're juggling a lot of balls. Mm -hmm. So where to end, which is the exact right end point can be harder to determine. I, if a poem is very long, it becomes a little bit, I think, symphonic, to go back to that musical metaphor. You've got different themes, different motifs, different mm -hmm. kind of threads, and you have to weave it back so that the audience gets a sense, oh, this must be the end coming, and then you get just the right amount of repetition with variation, and there you go. You, you know, you've been obviously uh, producing poetry for, for a number of decades. You were I love that idea of being middle-aged like the Atlantic, and... Um, are there, what's the oldest, this is somebody, somebody asked, so what the oldest poem is that you're working on or that you're revising? Like how far back do you have poems from the early days that you still kind of go back and look at? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm working on, as I said, on this big uh, Atlantic Ocean book and that stuff is all new. But before that book comes into the world, I'll have another book out of like poem poems. And some of those, a lot of that is new. I have new ones I've been writing. Um, that I've, I'm very excited about, but some of those, I really went back and, f and, and stumbled on some kind of pieces in like journals and stuff. Uh, one of those has got to be 30 years old. Oh, wow. Uh, I mean, I found it in an old notebook about Chicago before, you know, uh, I mean, 30 years ago. And I just said, oh, I like this. Whatever happened to this idea? And I picked it up and beat on it for a while with hammers until I said, okay, I think this is going to be a poem. I don't do that very often, but, um, because again, I, I kind of have projecty projects in yeah. which I'm generating work towards a, a goal, and others where I'm like, what other kind of fun poems are around, and how might they, you know, interact with each other? So, um, 
so that's, you know, but that's, it's not like, a, I mean, the, a famous example of this is Elizabeth, the poet Elizabeth Bishop, who famously had this poem where someone visited her in Brazil and this poem was tacked to her wall. And then they visited her 25 years later in Cambridge and the same poem was still tacked to her wall as like a work in progress. Right. right. I, I, you know, I, I'm not as, I'm not the perfectionist she was. So I don't, not every poem of mine has been being actively worked on it for 25 years. No. Yeah. But, no. And in the art world, Da Vinci was famous for just keeping things with him and constantly going and retouching them and, and things like this. So let me get to another, another question. Um, boy, the chat is kind of going uh, pretty fast. I'm trying to keep up with it. Uh, let me see. There was one down here. Um, so somebody said, uh, does it feel like we're living on the edge? Is that not like poetry itself? Um, that was kind of a, maybe a little more rhetorical. Somebody else said, um, well, maybe this is the same person said, uh, Priya Parker talks about the penultimate point of a gathering, the last call. Um, I don't know if that's something you want to reflect on. And, um, a falcon cannot hear the falconer. That's the line of poetry for, uh, I think for our moment, by the way. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, you know, which has to do with, I don't know, the, the moment and things. There's a sense, and we've been living with a sense of things spinning out of control for a while. And uh, in a way, the coronavirus actually, you know, has, has both amplified that and calmed it down. It's, it's been a strange, you know, turn of the wheel here because it, it certain political levels are still spinning where they are, but people's personal lives have been so focused inward that people have had self-reflection, something we have very little of in modern American society has, has kind of thrust itself back upon us, which has been interesting. Yeah, and uh, here's another question. If you were to categorize yourself, what would it be? A war poet, nature poet, some other type of poet? Do you think about yourself in that, in that way? Uh, I would say, uh, I'm not a nature poet. I love nature poets. I wish I was a nature poet. Um, I mean, I love, you know, I, I just before this event, I was teaching a class. Some of my students are on here. We were reading haiku. I mean, I would love to be Basho, you know, I would love to, to be able to slow down my life enough to live in the instant of perceiving a beautiful piece of the natural or spiritual world. Our, our worlds are so fast and spinning and we're so being constantly self-distracted. We rarely do that. I would love to be that. I, I mean, I think what I most, you know, I, I'm, I try to write different kinds of poems. I'm mostly a kind of sociocultural poet. I mean, that poem about Miami Beach, you know, whether mm -hmm. it's Chicago, which I've written about, whether it's America as a whole and materialism and consumerism or a, a specific place, a specific piece of the American cultural matrix. That's what I, I, I that's what I do. I think that's most also unique in that it's not usually what poets take as their particular enterprise. It's always, mm -hmm. again, if I wasn't a poet, I don't, I wouldn't want to be another kind of writer. I would rather be a cultural historian or an anthropologist. Uh, so here's another question. How do you decide? Um, Cause you talk about being this type of poet. How do you decide which events to write about every year in the, the 20th century poems? Oh, that, yeah, that's in, the 20th century poems was really, a, that was a whole book of, it was one poem per year of the 20th century. And it was complicated because there was one or two years where I had like three different poems for that year. And then there were other years where I had nothing. I'm like, I don't know what to write about, like 1952. I, well, I'm not even sure that was a good year. But uh, how did I decide? So sometimes I, in a couple instances, I realized later I had included the wrong poem. Like I, I put a poem in and people were later like, oh, this poem over here is so great. Why didn't you put it in the book? I'm like, I don't know. I, I thought the other, I don't know. I guess I was an idiot. I didn't know. <laughs> I just wrote about, I, I, I mean, I picked up the 20th century as if I was like, I had certain things I knew I liked and then other voices just jumped out at me. Like, you know, uh, and uh, I mean, like, I don't know, from Jane Goodall to like Pablo Picasso, people that I knew I was vaguely interested in and you, you read books about them, you explore them and sometimes their voice I could channel some voices and not others. So mm. uh, I, I then attended to their lives and just thought of, you know, so my Jane Goodall poem, I think that falls in the first year she went to start her study of the chimps. Mm -hmm. in, uh, yeah. And, you know, so, uh, so then there's a little bit of luck and a little bit of, and a lot of research involved in that particular project. Yeah, I that, can imagine. Like, that book was like being a historian rather than being a poet. Right, right. But kind of connecting, I think, as you're formulating a century. Exactly. Um, uh, so there's a kind of 
question that's not really about poetry, but asking what kind of music are you listening to now and what's inspiring and informing your poetry? Mm. What kind of music? I, I always listen to the same kind of wavelengths of music, which is kind of alt country and uh, kind of alternative rock of the post pavement stripe. But I've actually been listening to less music in the last two years than, than ever in my life for some reason. I don't know why. I've, I've, I just, I'm not that's interesting. Just some sort of middle agedness. The platforms keep changing, and now I have to live stream it on whatever. I don't yeah. know. Somehow, just being able, you know, I know I, I'm not like <laughs> you're middle aged. <laughs> I'm not wishing I had old LPs, but like the dematerialization of music. Is CDs. Like what was wrong with that? <laughs> it's almost like nothing behind. I'm like ah, it's just a bunch of noise. It turns out it's not. Uh, well, along the line of music, do meter and other forms play a role in your compositions and your poetic compositions? Uh, very rarely, sometimes. Uh, you know, the, my, my, my poetic seminar, we, we started with meter and the, tr the English tradition mm -hmm. before you know, moving through various wavelengths and getting all the way to Basho. Um, so I think, you know, T.S. Eliot coined the phrase, the ghost of an ambic pentameter. So the ghost, of, a, the ghost of, of traditional metrics is often heard in any poet who's, you know, read the canon. Um, mm -hmm. But few, no, not, not, not few, there's, there's, there's traditionalist poets out there, but I don't almost ever try to count my syllables. It's, you know, you don't, you don't really get me started on this topic exactly in a, in a detailed way, but, you know. <laughs> Have another it's, sip. It was just... I There's think there's reality to the actual metrics that doesn't make sense. I'm glad we've abandoned them, but the spirit of them is empowering. And um, you mentioned your students of so which contemporary, here's a question about which contemporary poets uh, you've taught for the first time recently that you're glad to bring into the classroom and found fruitful with your students. Oh, uh, wow, that's very interesting. Um, well, one name that comes to mind is Hanif al Rakib who's a really interesting poet who came down, whom I learned about through O Miami. He came down to do an O Miami event two years ago, um, right when I was compiling a syllabus of kind of new poetics to think about with some of my students. And um, he's a really interesting poet who writes, he writes a lot about, he, he's more well known right now actually as a music critic. He writes about hip hop and, and a lot of kinds of music, but he's a really interesting poet. Um, and I, uh, I, I brought his work in and people really, really responded to that really powerfully. I thought that was really, really useful. Um, it's, you know, someone asked, I was talking to a, a class at Indiana University the other day, and they were saying, like, what younger poets you listen to? I'm like, well, at this point, I have, like, three generations of younger poets, kind of, <laughs> you know, or, like, two and a half behind me. Uh -huh. um, so, you know, like I said, some of the people I consider younger poets, you guys probably consider, you know, senior, like, if I say Kevin Young, you guys are like, Oh, that's a revered senior figure, and to me, that's still a you know a yeah. younger poet. So th there's that kind of like, you know, there used to be three generations ahead of me, and now through the inevitable process that we're all participating in, many of them have moved off stage, and there's only one generation ahead of me, or one and a half. Right. But now there's three generations of really exciting poets behind me coming up from some of my own former students who I see here, and you know, poets still in their tw late twenties and thirties. That's one whole group, and then there's kind of two other groups. Uh, in there, you know, Gen, Gen Xers and Millennials, or I'm mm -hmm. never really clear on how all those things shake down. You have a couple of questions about, again, about advice and, and writing and things like this, but there's one that's just a quickie uh, pop culture question. Are you watching The Tiger King? And if so, do you have any thoughts on why it's popular? Because we live in a strange country. Because <laughs> it's all about Florida. Does that mean you're watching it? <laughs> no, I, 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 I'm going, my, um, I would be watching it more actively, except that uh, uh, our son Jackson watched it without us, rudely, leaving oh. Elizabeth and I behind. So we're having to catch up kind of slowly. But, you know, basically you get off the highway at, at any exit in Florida, and, you know, there's a two-thirds chance you end up in the world of the Tiger King is kind of how I, you know, how I see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, exactly. Um, okay, the going back to the poetry, would you would give, um, what kind of advice or assignment would you give a poet to help them write about where they live, such as you have? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, I have, I mean, I think for me, for some poets, not all poets, landscape 
physical landscape is a really important thing. There was a great book that that people like Bruce and myself read back in the day by Richard Hugo called The Triggering Town. Everybody had read that book. These days, kids don't read it. I mean, you know, young younger poets, suppose in their 20s, you know, some do, of course, but it's not, it's no longer any sort of central text. It's about how Richard Hugo, who was from the Great Plains or, or lived a long time, you know, found just the, the act of driving across Montana and seeing little towns flash past, really triggering poems. They, you know, they, they, they just brought that material to the surface. So um, I would recommend that book as a thing that just talks about it in his life. I don't, I've never codified my thinking on it, but just being in the physical space you're in first as a material landscape and then thinking about culture, the names of the flowers, mm -hmm. it's just, uh, I'm fascinated by place. Yeah, no, I think that, uh, and kind of leads into this other question about it, how you think poetry intersects with other disciplines. And if you know, the question also says, if, and if you do think it intersects well with other disciplines, uh, do you know of any other disciplines that it does intersect with well? Well, I used to be, I used to be a poetry elitist, of course. <laughs> Thank God those while times all, changed. <laughs> well, we all recognize poetry's place at the head of the artistic table. <laughs> Whoa, you're talking to an architect, the queen of the arts. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, we do need places to live, John. We do need buildings. I, I recognize the importance. Um, I, 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 I used to be uh, more or less blind to the importance of poetry's conjunction with other arts. It's become much more important to me, you know, in whatever, the last 10 years. Uh, I saw Tom Virgin on here a little while ago. Um, you know, the, the visual arts in terms of printing, these prints above my head were printed by Tom Virgin. Um, and he's done an amazing talk about literary arts in Miami. I think the way the visual arts and literary arts worlds have have come together to create works that combine liter you know text and visual art has been really important. Obviously, music is a is a great uh, place for the poetry to to find itself. I mean, I you know reading with a musician or people will occasionally write to me and say, I want to set a poem of yours to music or what have you. Those are obvious uh, ways that they come together. So, I, I mean, for me, it starts, you go back one step. I think all of, all of art, art making is the state, is the important impulse is art making. The notion of having this creative impulse, a creative urge. It almost doesn't matter what form it takes. I mean, you know, dance to pottery to poetry. Those are, that's almost a technicality. That's, that's figuring out, what you can actually do. I mean, if I had said I want to be a potter, that would have been a terrible decision. I would have been bad. But I knew I had that impulse, make art, create. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I tried a few disciplines and the one that worked, A, I loved it most, and B, I, I could do it, was poetry. Mm -hmm. So I don't, you know, I think if you have that impulse to make art, you should be very restless with that impulse. You should say, oh, I like poems, but maybe I should try photography. And why wouldn't I try, you know, dance and pottery and Mm -hmm. and i don't know computer graphics whatever than modern art exactly well just while you were talking tom virgin actually chimed in and says he said it's a good time to read my music so oh no i'm not gonna read it but i know i know i know i just thought I'd, tom, you were right it's always a good time to read that poem but except for now okay uh, another question was uh <laughs> Are you? Are there any sites or platforms that are specifically capturing poetic voices and responses to what's going on uh, today? A sort of space for poetic oral history of the moment. That is a very interesting question, and I would guess that there are. I don't know them by name. I mean, I you know I see every day on my on Facebook about you know dozens of poets who are doing various kinds of projects, reading a poem a day, or. Uh, Cre you know, creating kind of responses to the moment. Um, my response has been instead to to uh, pilot the coronavirus Hawaiian shirt challenge, where I'm wearing a different Hawaiian shirt every wow. day for the month of April. That's my, you know, your contribution. Wow. That's my yeah. contribution. Thank you, John. Um, I, 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 I'm sh that. That's a great question that is pointed directly at something I'm very sure really smart people are doing, I don't know the right, uh, you know, name to point you at. 
There's so we have two questions kind of about your this that continue this quarantine moment uh, kind of inquiry. One is what do you find yourself missing uh, the most during quarantine? And the other is it could be this could be about any time. How do you nourish and cultivate your seemingly bottomless well of creativity? Ah, um, I think it might be a contradiction to nourish a bottomless well. At, at the very least, it's a mixed metaphor. Uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> well, I mean, free time, free time, you know, I mean, well, okay, let me go to this. My, one of my very favorite phrases, which is creative loafing, which is Walt Whitman in Song of Myself, where he says, I loaf and invite my soul. So, you know, you loaf and invite your soul, which is to say, you, you bring the soul into the conversation and you bring creativity into the conversation through loafing, but which is not to say, uh, which is not to say playing Animal Crossing, it's to say actually kind of somehow finding the creative side of um, tasklessness, just being in the world and letting the world, letting yourself be in the world and letting the world come to you. So again, lockdown makes this harder because normally what I would like to do is go walk on the beach, you know, and then take mm -hmm. a swim. And I find that to be deeply, deeply kind of right. creatively and spiritually nourishing. But we can't quite do it. So it's a very good question what we do to nourish ourselves. I think we do things like we're doing right now here, right, in this gathering, is you, you go online since you can't go into the real world. And um, were there two more poems that you were going to read, or did you finish the... Um, I was going to read two more. I don't know what can our Can you read two more, and then we'll, do, then we'll uh, call it an evening? Okay, perfect. Perfect. That's great. Um, I'm going to read... Uh, I'm gonna read two poems. This first one's called The Everglades, and it's, uh, it's a poem I wrote actually, the National Parks had a project with the, the Academy of American Poets, where they had poets write about a national park in their state. I guess they did it for all 50 states, and, and so I, did, I wrote a poem for The Everglades. The Everglades. Green and blue and white, it is a flag for Florida stitched by hungry ibises. It is a paradise of flocks, a cornucopia of wind and grass and dark slow waters. Turtles bask in the last tatters of afternoon. Frogs perfect their symphony at dusk. In its solitude, we remember ourselves dimly as creatures of mud and starlight. Clouds and savannas and horizons, its emptiness is an antidote. Its ink illuminates the manuscript of the heart. It is not ours, though it is ours to destroy or preserve. This, the kingdom of otter, kingfisher, alligator, heron. If the sacred is a river within us, let it flow like this, serene and magnificent, forever. And then one last poem from Florida Poems, going back to the old days, which is uh, another poem about arriving in the strange Martian paradise of South Florida from the North, the Northlands. And it's also a love poem for Elizabeth, of course. And it's the zebra longwing, which is the, uh, our state butterfly here in Florida is the zebra longwing. Forty years I've waited, uncomprehending, for these winter nights, when the butterflies fold themselves like paper cranes to sleep in the dangling roots of the orchids boxed and hung from the live oak tree. How many there are, six, eight, eleven. When I miss the spikes and blossoms by moonlight, they stir but do not wake, antennaed and dreaming of passion flower nectar. Never before have they gifted us in like manner. Never before have they stilled their flight in our garden. Wings have borne them away from the silk of the past, as surely as some merciful wind has delivered us to an anchorage of such abundant grace, Elizabeth. All my life I have searched without knowing it. For this moment. 
That's wonderful. Very, very beautiful. I'm going to unmute everybody to give you a round of applause. So please uh, be prepared. We're, it's a, could be a raucous moment. Here we go. Thank you, Campbell. Thank you, thank you. Wonderful job. Wonderful job. Thank you.